Friends, in this video I will tell you about my experience of breeding bees in a plastic bottle. I believe that using this novel beekeeping technique each of us will be able to provide our family with high quality honey, bee bread, pollen, royal jelly, draw milk, propolis and other beekeeping products. This is a natural almost non-contact way of beekeeping in a transparent beehive. Therefore, you will be able to monitor the life of your bees and they won't sting you. Moreover, you will be able to start living in the comfort of your own bee therapy house. In other words, you can provide your relatives with a lifestyle in conditions of continuous AP therapy, improving health and prolonging life for your loved ones and yourself. Unlike traditional beekeeping, my method is very inexpensive, doesn't require deep knowledge in beekeeping, and best of all, consumes minimal free time for this trade. And all this is for the sake of a purpose, which I will reveal at the end of the video. Experts assert that the most difficult thing in agriculture is animal husbandry and the most difficult thing in animal husbandry is beekeeping. To get bees and try yourself in traditional beekeeping, you will need to invest a lot of money, time and effort. And according to statistics, your apiary will most likely die within a year or two. You will need to build or buy beehives, beehive frames with wax foundation, a honey extractor, wax press, queen excluder, smoker, feeders, specialized clothing, and a long list of other needed supplies. It is impossible to be a beekeeper with an apiary consisting of only one bee colony, so your expenses will start from around $10,000, and only a few beekeepers will be lucky to recapture this investment. All bees in apiary can die at any time, even if a beekeeper is an experienced professional. They can be poisoned unintentionally or on purpose, they can get infected by multiple diseases, or they can be killed by abnormal weather conditions. The risks are abundant. After a couple of years, you will acquire a huge store of knowledge and, according to statistics, most likely give up this occupation. Under such conditions, a gamble with an apiary is possible only out of ignorance. However, beekeeping in a bottle is real beekeeping, not a honey hunting. In addition, your initial investment is minimal. The bottle is free, while the bee frames, wax foundation, honey extractor and other equipment are not needed. However, after a year of such simplified beekeeping, you will receive your first honey, wax, as well as knowledge of the bee's life and the melliferous plants of your area. And then you can decide if you want to do this trade further without financial turmoil. It is going to be much easier and cheaper to develop a bottle apiary than a traditional one. Perhaps over time, bottle beekeeping will turn out to be even more progressive than traditional one. It is also conceivable that you may transition to conventional beekeeping after gaining a few years of bottle beekeeping experience. In all honesty, both beekeeping methods can be used simultaneously at the same apiary. One beekeeping technique in no way excludes the other. It is from my experience that it is pretty easy to keep bees in large plastic kegs. Such keg hive is similar to a natural tree hollow hive. However, a beekeeper can add honey supers to it, which dramatically simplifies the process of honey harvesting. Whether there will be comb frames in a keg hive or not is the choice of the beekeeper. Personally, I don't really like frames for several reasons. As a beekeeper, I've always been bothered by traces of mildew on my wooden frames and the hive's inner walls. Even without honey, wood contains some glucose, which is food for fungus and mold. If the wood gets wet, fungus and mold will immediately start growing on it. This is not a problem in the summer, but during wintering, a bee colony would evaporate tens of liters of water, which would then condense inside a natural tree hollow, in a hive's walls or on wooden frames. The wood gets wet and inevitably gets darker from the fungus. Since the bees are crawling on the mold, its spores can get into the honey and bee bread. I would much rather avoid that. And I love the fact that after two years of keeping bees in unframed plastic bottles, I haven't noticed even trace of mold or mildew in them. Of course, the same amount of condensate appears in plastic hives as in a tree hollow. However, not only does it not absorb anywhere, but it also flows down the walls out of the bottle's neck, forming an icicle. This gives hope that mold cannot get into the honey, although I'm probably being overcautious about the whole thing. Bees are comfortable in such a transparent hollow, but pathogens and parasites are not. For example, 
a veromite that has fallen off a bee would fall out through the neck cone, preventing a reinfestation on another bee. Bees do not live in tree hollows or wooden hives per se. Bees live in wax combs, and it is secondary where their beeswax structure is located. It may as well be in the open air. In reality, a tree hollow or a bottle protects the honey and brood combs from birds, insects, large animals and bad weather, as well as helping to maintain the microclimate for the brood combs. Bees barely come into contact with plastic hives walls, except at the tap hole. I use plastic that was approved for storing beverages for humans, which means it was approved by food protection agencies. If you have information on PET polymer being dangerous for humans, please let me know. The idea to adopt a plastic bottle as a beehive came to me four years ago in Tanzania, right after descent from Mount Kilimanjaro. I saw with my own eyes that people are still barbarously using log hives, essentially ignoring modern beekeeping. At that time, I became convinced that southern bees that don't experience wintering easily survive in such narrow miniature logs. So I thought the bees would be even more comfortable in large plastic bottles and even more so in plastic kegs. It would only be necessary to properly prep and insulate these bottle hives. For a bee colony to survive through winter in a natural tree hollow, its diameter must be at least 20 cm and the tree trunk must be at least 35-40 cm. Using a 9 liter plastic bottle, you can simulate a good sized log where bees can successfully endure winter even in our northern forests. However, I can't fully claim this bottle hive idea as my own. Modern archaeologists revealed that the bottle hive design concept is a few thousand years old. Through excavating ancient Sumerian tombs, they recorded clay vessels used as beehives, so the idea of keeping bees in an artificial vessel is at least 3000 years old. My innovation is a little different. Because plastic bottles, unlike log hives, are very light, they can be easily stacked and joined. In other words, you can easily expand bottle hives upwards or downwards. I'm sure the beekeepers have already guessed what I'm driving at, and the rest of the viewers might need a few explanations. Each bee colony is eventually doomed to degeneration and death in the natural environment, but it can live practically forever with some help from a beekeeper. You might know a working bee life cycle. The queen lays an egg in a comb cell, the larva emerges, the larva is fed, it turns into a nymph, the nymph pupates, the pupa turns into an adult bee and emerges from the cocoon. As soon as the young bee emerges from its cell, it cleans it, but part of the cocoon will always remain in the cell. The next bee hatched from the cell will have a little less space for its development and it will be slightly smaller in size than the previous one. After each hatching cycle, the honeycomb cell will be slightly smaller and darker. When the bees inevitably fill the entire space of a tree hollow with honey, the queen will lay eggs in the same honey-free comb cells. So each new generation of bees will be smaller and smaller. The bees will degenerate and the bee colony will eventually die, leaving a tree hollow filled with honey. It happens because bees cannot renew their honeycombs, but the beekeeper can. My non-contact method of bottle beekeeping ensures a timely comb rotation, preventing colony degeneration. The idea is this. Because bees always deposit honey from top to bottom, when a bottle on the top level, which acts as a honey super, is fully filled with honey and the bees move to a deep super, I remove it and expand the deep super downwards by adding a new bottle, forcing bees to use aging comb cells for honey storage. Thus, the new wax comb from the new bottle will be used for hatching brood. In other words, they always use a new comb for brood, ensuring a timely comb rotation, preventing their nucleus degeneration. During the whole process, there is no need to open the beehive, move its frames and disturb the bees. In essence, this is the method of an endless tree hollow, but with some innovative nuances. Of course, a record honey yield cannot be achieved this way, but the method has its advantages. And most of all, its simplicity and accessibility would work for literally anyone. Also, a completely transparent beehive allows you to observe and study bees' life continuously with your own eyes from all sides. Thanks to keeping bees in bottles over the past two years, without exaggeration, I have learned a lot about them. All in all, this is unusual and interesting, but there is more on that later. And now, for those who have watched the video up to this point, 
I will reveal a secret and explain why I spent the expensive time of an attorney on beekeeping instead of buying honey in a store. It is simple. I'm afraid to consume store-bought honey and my fears are divided in two parts. Everyone knows that the varroa might decrease the population of the wild honeybees and to save their bees, beekeepers began to use anti-mite product such as amitraz, a poison that kills insects. If the dosage is proper, it only kills a mite. At least that's the idea. Amitraz can be poisonous and even fatal to a human, so I do not use it, which makes beekeeping more complex of a process for me. Commercial beekeepers sell honey to wholesalers at $2 per kilogram in the best years. I don't believe that there is no amitraz in the honey jar bought in the store. This is half the problem. The second half is that I'd rather not eat honey harvested on land where pesticides, insecticides, gross accelerators and other chemicals are used to preserve and increase the yield. Everyone knows that if you move your apiary to a flowering field where bad chemicals were used at the time, then the bees will die while collecting poisonous nectar from there and I wouldn't want to eat honey produced from such nectar. I counted the cost of my friend's sizable organic apiary and it turns out that he is selling honey at a net loss. This cannot last long. I believe that if you want something of a high quality, you're better off doing it yourself. Therefore, I'm a beekeeper and I want to share this non-commercial honey production technique with you. Dear fellow beekeepers, please don't scold me in the comments for revealing the commercial industry secret. I assure you, this negative publicity will not harm you in any way, but probably only bring you more educated customers who will want to buy organic honey from you directly. I don't have agricultural fields in my vicinity, so I'm pretty confident about the high quality of my honey. However, some people might still use chemicals in their gardens and orchards in my village. Even though I can't physically transport my custom-made long and wide frame beehives, I can easily take my bottle and keg hives with bees to the woods, at least 4 kilometers from my village, and then I could be sure my honey is chemical free. I assure you, I'm not against centrifugally harvested honey in the least. It's good, but crushed honey has its benefits. It tastes different and has a lot more pollen grains, making it more valuable from a medical standpoint. I really like crushed honey and therefore I even built a manual honey press to make it easier to separate honey from the wax. If you're not in a hurry, honey will drain from the honeycomb through a sieve. The pressed wax and all of the equipment with honey remnants can be given to bees for drying and in a couple of hours they'll pick up all the honey to the last drop. So I don't have to wash my honey press, knife, plastic honey bottles and other equipment. Moreover, this honey will not disappear, I will harvest it from the bees next year. Also, farmer's beekeeping does not require the use of a honeycomb foundation, which further increases the quality of honey. The fact is that beekeepers rarely make their own foundation, and one cannot be sure there are no chemicals in the purchased foundation. I'm not even talking about paraffin, which can be deadly for the bee larva. I mean the poisons of the acaricide group, such as amitraz. These pesticides are not entirely harmless to humans in any dose. But enough about honey. Back to the bees. This is how a barren queen bee looks just emerging from the queen cell. To prevent swarming, the old queen must be removed from the hive before a young queen emerges. If you put a queen cell in a bottle and pour a handful of bees into it, then you'll get a new populated bee nucleus, which may develop into a full-fledged family and even independently survive winter on its own honey. And all this is almost maintenance-free. It sounds like it's make-believe, but look how these bees manage to develop in just 10 days after the queen's mating flight. By the way, such a bottle hive is an excellent platform for breeding and mating queen bees. A helpful note to bee breeders. If you take an infertile queen to an island or swamp in such a bottle, then you can be assured it will mate with your drones. If there is no extra queen or a queen cell at hand, then a brood of different ages can be planted into the bottle, making sure there are several fresh eggs in the brood. Orphan bees never leave the brood unattended and will build fistulous queen cells by enlarging cells holding freshly laid bee eggs. Later, a young queen will emerge from the queen cell, mate and lay eggs. The nucleus will quickly develop into a new colony with a young, strong queen. 
if you do not make specialized sectional brood frames for placing brood strips into bottles, part of the brood will die when being cut out of the comb. Even though it is a norm for a bee colony, I find it emotionally disturbing. So I'm experimenting with the design of brood frames. You can populate the bees in the bottle in different ways. You can pour them through a funnel into the bottle, or you can place the bottle over a hive as a honey super. Then the bees will inevitably go into the bottle to protect, feed and heat the brood in it. Perhaps this is the most progressive way of populating a plastic bottle with bees. However, this specific topic is probably more interesting to beekeepers, not the broad audience, and I will say a few words about it later. You probably noticed that I placed a couple of 30 liter kegs with bees in the forest while some were installed in my house's facade. I also placed plastic bottles in the garden as well as in the living rooms of my salmon house. I can observe bottled honey bees daily to monitor their development and soothe the itch of the naturalist. You can see so much more of the bees activities inside a bottle hive than in a one frame demonstration hive. You can literally observe the natural life of a bee colony from all angles. For example, you can observe a nymph, larva, a bee pupa at each stage of its development. Shown here are typical movements of a laying worker bee. And in the same place, on the right side of the frame, you can see a sealed drone cell in the working bee brood. You can observe the dynamics of how the bees are constantly changing the configuration of the honeycomb. This observation of the bee colony throughout the season has significantly advanced my understanding of the bees' biology and social organization. A few words about apotherapy should be added. Have you noticed that on average beekeepers live longer than non-beekeepers? Some say that the vibration emitted by bees has a positive effect on human health. The air they breathe from the hive has a beneficial effect on a person. Indeed, the hum and pleasant aroma from the hive is hard to miss. There is certainly a positive health effect caused by bees. To me, it is not so important what causes it, whether it's fighting sites, vibrations, or a placebo effect. When you live in a house where the very atmosphere is considered to be healing by your loved ones, then, even for the sake of this psychotherapeutic effect, it is worth trying such a home air period. What do you think? I didn't suspend the bottles the way the Tanzanians hang their log hives. I've tried it, and it is doable. However, it will complicate their insulation, darkening, replacement, and their connections with other bottles. Plus, they will dangle in the wind, which would disturb the bees. A rigid attachment made from a few planks is more rational. Such setup can be made quickly and it is more convenient to use it. You may have noticed that the recent legislation changes made beekeeping extremely complicated from a legal standpoint. It often turns a beekeeper into a lawbreaker, but not when you just place a bottle of bees in the forest. Only you know where the bees are. Perhaps such legal invulnerability is another plus in unconventional bottle beekeeping. Where do you begin? If you're not a beekeeper, where can you get your first colony in a bottle? There are several options. Using such bottles, you can catch swarms in your area. Alternatively, you can buy a swarm from a beekeeper and transfer it in a bottle yourself, which will not be easy. Or you can simply order a frameless bee split in a bottle in advance and buy it in the spring. Now, if you're not a beekeeper, you may wonder how you could split one colony into two with a non-contact method. You can connect a new empty bottle to the existing populated bottle, and then, when there is brood in both bottles, you could physically separate them without contact. In the bottle where there is no queen, the bees themselves will make a queen cell and develop a new queen. Here is an old colony and a split from it that I created using a non-contact method. All that is needed is to connect, disconnect, and relocate the plastic bottles followed by screwing a plastic cap onto the tap holes, the role of which is played by the neck of the bottle. As you can see, a completely non-contact beekeeping technique is available to anybody. The slogan, beekeeping to the masses, no longer seems so far-fetched. It would be difficult to overestimate the benefits of bottle splits at an apiary, as it is very convenient to keep spare queens in such bottles throughout the year. In such a bottle, queens can successfully overwinter. Any beekeeper would agree that it is nice to have a reserve of healthy mated queens around early springtime. 
Lastly, this is a 3D split without a honeycomb, which can be transferred to a new hive with frames in a matter of minutes. Another important result of my experiments suggests that if you don't fight the varroa mite at all, then some colonies and bottles will die during wintering, but those that survive the winter will continue to overwinter the following seasons successfully. Moreover, after division of the overwintered colony, both bee families are more likely to survive through the winter successfully. This means that natural selection favors varroa resistant bees. This is extremely important. With the widespread use of this method, bees that are not resistant to varatosis will be forced out of the population. Then varatosis will cease to be a threat to honeybees. This is a hypothesis worth testing. In cold weather and at night, the field bees do not fly and rather they just sit in the bottle. It is better to manipulate them at this time. Of course, the video quality is not going to be the best for this clip. By the way, in this segment I removed the top bottle with 100% honeycombs because I installed a queen excluder in the bottle's neck. A queen bee, being much larger than regular bees, cannot fit through it. Therefore, the bottle contains only the honeycombs without brood. Wooden skewers further secure wax combs inside the bottle, adding stability for them in the heat and during transportation. I've been practicing field experiments with bottle beekeeping for almost three years. And obviously, I have yet to develop an optimal technique for bottle beekeeping in such a short time, especially working alone. With that being said, I will omit showing my rejected techniques in order to prevent confusion. However, I wanted to draw your attention to some successful design features that proved to be effective. Be sure to make an additional side tap hole in the bottle hive using the neck of another bottle. In the event of the simultaneous death of a few dozen bees, they can plug the lower entrance with their bodies and interrupt the ventilation causing the death of the whole colony. The improvised tap hole can be simply hot glued or press fit into the drilled hole. It is advisable to place the side tap hole on the tapered part of the bottle so that it is easier to insulate the bottle hive with foam. For insulation, it is best to use self-adhesive construction foam. Insulation and darkening of bottle hives that I use outdoors is mandatory to prevent condensation in cold weather and wax melting in hot weather. From my experience, the bees are very comfortable in a bottle hive with such insulation, even in extreme temperatures. I noticed that during hot days, the bees bulged out from tap holes for ventilation in my conventional hives, while the bottle bees were quiet and continued to carry nectar. Apparently, the bottle hive's thermoregulation was helped by the vertical ventilation that cycled through and did not regulate the air draft in any way, although I have to regulate the openings of my conventional hive's tap holes in extreme temperatures. Speaking of polyethylene insulation, a 1 cm thick layer of foam with a reflective coating can match a 10 cm thick wooden board in terms of thermal insulation. The bees seem to be totally happy with its properties. In this shot, it is minus 15 degrees Celsius and there is virtually no frost on the ceiling of the bottle, even though the bees almost completely covered the upper tap hole with propolis. In the spring, they will reopen it. If you make a hole in the bottle cap, heat the mesh and melt it into the end of the cap, you will get a wonderful screw-on vent. When transporting the bottles with bees, it is very useful and can be made in just a couple of minutes from scrap materials. Ventilation is extremely important for bees. The thing is, bees quickly plug up any small holes in the bottle with propolis, so ventilation is best done using additional tap holes or vents. I bought used 30-liter plastic cakes for a couple of dollars and they gave me a few extra for free, just to get rid of them. The material is not expensive at all. Keep in mind, cakes could still be under high pressure, so the first step is to depressurize them. To do this, it is enough to press on the rubber seal. PET kegs are wonderful craft material. You can cut them as you like with any sharp tool such as a utility knife or scissors. I made a simple lathe-like jig to make quick even cuts. Of course, going into trouble making this keg cutting jig is justified only if you need to accurately cut a lot of kegs. I have already used more than two dozen kegs for experiments, so it made sense in my case. As you can see, it is not at all difficult to assemble kegs into one endless tube. 
and this structure can be applied in other DIY areas besides beekeeping. Did you guess what I'm hinting at? And this is how a keg hive with frames looks. I wouldn't say that this design is particularly successful or convenient, but it is definitely an ultralight and a super cheap hive. It is from my experience that for making a split nucleus, a queen's breeding container and dividing bee colonies, it is better to use plastic bottles up to one liter. This means that you can get up to nine splits and then combine them with five liter bottles. Up to nine such splits can easily fit in one 10 frame hive or nine queens from one orphan family. Of course, they won't be the strongest queens, but there will be nine of them at once. Even a litter of bees in a bottle placed in a greenhouse will pollinate tomatoes or cucumbers with a bang. And in the fall they can be joined to another family and change the old queen at the same time if necessary. This is multitasking in beekeeping. As you can see, bottles of different designs are connected using a transition threads of different diameter to make this non-contact beekeeping method more convenient and reliable. You may have noticed that my keg hive mounting boards are designed to hold two kegs sequentially plus two cantilevered kegs. Four kegs with honey weigh more than 150 kilograms, 330 pounds. I'm afraid the robes will not support such a weight. Therefore, for a beekeeper who visits his keg hives in the woods and harvests honey once every three years, it is better to use a long board attachment setup. As far as using self-tapping screws on a live tree, I don't know of a more gentle way of attaching an object to a living tree than temporarily fastening it with screws. The self-tapping screw pushes the wood fibers apart without severing them. And most importantly, sap flow is not disturbed. I can't think of anything worse than using a clamp or a rope for this purpose, which can result in slow death of a tree. If you know a more gentle way of attaching a heavy object to a living tree, please advise in the comment section below. I will be grateful. So as you can see, over the past few years I have done a series of experiments on keeping bees in bottle hives of different shapes and sizes. With the results from these experiments, I'm trying to find a way to promote the spread of non-commercial beekeeping on the planet Earth in an avalanche-like way. Such a beekeeping revolution can save pollinators from extinction and pollinated ecosystems from decline, thus preventing world hunger. Humankind can live without honey, but without bees it will starve. To solve such an ambitious task and obtain reliable information on the topic, the research of one person over a short period of time is obviously not enough, and I'm not used to sharing hasty conclusions. Therefore, this year I'm publishing only a review video in order to attract beekeepers' interest and encourage further experiments. I will tentatively publish a detailed description of my bottle beekeeping technique next year, so the bottle hive beekeeping story is to be continued. Stay tuned for new videos. I really hope after watching this video some people will change their understanding of bees, beekeeping, as well as the benefits of honey. Maybe some of you will become beekeepers, extending their lives for yourself and your loved ones. Humankind can live without honey, but would starve without bees. If the innovative topic of this video is replicated by other beekeepers as actively as my video about the bottle cutter or the clamper tool, then my hope to stop the honey bee extinction will have a real chance to come true. Fellow beekeepers, don't stand aside. Make similar experiments on the topic, film them and share the results on YouTube. Together we have a high chance to succeed. I can see that because of the grandiose goal, the video turned out to be somewhat pretentious. But I hope you will not judge me harshly. One head is good, but two is better. Write your ideas and considerations. I read all of the comments. P.S. I understand that you're waiting for a video about the construction of my log cabin in the deep Karelian forest. This year, I built a bridge across the stream to my cabin past the water mill. It is an 11 meter long bent glued bridge made entirely of downed hardwood. This is probably the most difficult project to date at my camp and the video editing is not simple, but I'm doing my best to complete the task to share it with you soon. You may have noticed I do not publish my videos often and even if you subscribe to the channel you will most likely not receive a new video notification, but you can try to set up a bell for all notifications. 
they say it helps. Additional thank you for sharing my videos with your friends and writing comments. I read all of them. This was Max Igorov, St. Petersburg, Russia. And let good people watch good videos. I hope to see you back on the Volker Makes.